Welcome to Private Club Radio, your weekly source for industry education, news and discussion. Broadcasting from Tampa, Florida, ladies and gentlemen, here is your host, Gabriel Aloisi. Welcome to 2017. New year, new opportunities, new set of goals, a new start. I'm excited for this upcoming year. I loved 2016, and I'm hoping that I love 2017 even more. And I hope this year brings a lot of joy and a lot of satisfaction to you. We have a end-of-the-year wrap-up show. We're going to highlight the best of 2016 here today on Private Club Radio. I feel so blessed and so honored to have had the cream of the crop, the best of the best, the who's who of the private club radio industry on this show last year in 2016. I never would have guessed a year ago when I started the show that I would be able to get access to some of the people that we've actually had on this show. But everybody in this industry from bottom to top has been incredibly accommodating. And because of that, the show has grown and expanded. If you listen to our 50th show celebration, you learn that this show hit over 13,000 unique listeners across the world. And I was really proud that that was able to be accomplished in just a short one year's time. That's over two people for every private club that's out there in the world. So pretty, pretty cool. So I really want to thank the guests that we've had on the show. Each and every one of them was special and had something really profound to offer you and me. There were so many enlightening remarks. It's honestly really tough to choose between them. And being that I don't want to take up too much of your time, unfortunately can't play a clip from every single guest that we've had on the show, but I picked some ones that I think are some real gems and I hope you enjoy this best of show. The first clip I'm going to bring you is all the way back in episode number one of Private Club Radio, the inaugural episode where we had Rick Coyne, CEO of the Professional Club Marketing Association on. And in this clip, we're talking about how clubs can stay relevant. And I asked Rick a very pointed question, and here is what he told us. Absolutely. So to that point, how should clubs be positioning themselves given these current factors in the marketplace? It's a great question. I, you know, the, the clubs have traditionally seen themselves as their closed environment. That's their community. That's their club community, uh, their club family, if you will. And when you look at the the marketplace today and the ever increasing need to replace lost members, at least in pace with attrition, it becomes abundantly clear that the club is not just serving one community. It's not just serving that existing member community. Because let's face it, some clubs are uh, made up of, of of an older, more mature generation. And if if that is who they're they're really programming and all of their events is is driven around that, the next generation of member, unless it happens to be a retirement community, is probably not going to be interested in what that club has to offer. So what we're seeing today is a club serving two communities. One is obviously, again, it's existing members, but then it's setting up the relevance, the brand that is attractive to that next generation of member. Typically, most of the studies out there suggest to us that that next generation of market in the traditional club is going to be uh, a household with the primary uh, income earner under 55 with children uh, living at home. And so that that demographic is seeing things um, a, a little bit differently maybe than their more mature uh, members. So it what we're, we're seeing clubs today having to program themselves into a much more relevant position. Relevancy is, is changing with each generation. I thought I'd morph into my father. I never did. I thought my daughters would morph into me. They never will. And as a consequence, the greatest challenge that clubs have today is, is remaining relevant to each of these generations, to the gender, to the family, and all of the cross-sections in between. I thought that was a really good piece of advice there from Rick, that you can't just focus on your current 
marketplace and current market conditions, but you really need to look forward. Just some great advice there. This next clip that I want to bring you is of Richard Copland, partner at Copland, Keebler, and Wallace back in episode two. And while we were talking with Dick, he shared with us his observations of the five characteristics that all great private clubs share. Here's what Dick had to say about it. When we travel around the country, we typically see three or four or five strategies that successful clubs engage in, and it's very consistent. Every time we work with a club board and we say, you know, this club board that understands the governance model and and they really are effective, uh, it's because they've gotten their organizational health right. Well, how do you get the organizational health right in a, in a private club? And we typically say there's there's really five ways of doing that. The first is to defining everybody's role, make, making sure that everybody knows, and it's on paper, it's memorialized, what are the functions of the board? What what does the board really do? And maybe it's as few as four or five. It might be as many as a dozen. It doesn't matter as long as they're written down. What are their roles? What are the roles of the committee members as well? Those two things are quite important. The second thing we talk about are action plans. How do you in fact, uh, get the process uh, done in the club. And how does that happen so that the board doesn't have to get involved in, in minutia? How can they stay focused on governance issues and and uh, look at things with, with the big picture in mind? And the action plans allow a board to do that. That's basically a process whereby they go through certain steps. If, if something is brought to them from a committee, there's a there's a thoughtful process that they go through in terms of of uh, adapting a recommendation from a committee or not. And that typically is done at the staff and committee level, not at the board level, when you get into the, the real specific issues in the club. Uh, the third thing we see in clubs that are uh, successful is that they've defined their mission statement. We call it the magic of the mission statement, the, the mission statement and the supporting goals. They've clearly thought through who they are, what their function is. They, they know what their brand is in the marketplace. And that uh, that mission statement is is prevalent in the club. It's sometimes uh, on the on the front door of the club. We were just at a club in Florida that actually has their mission statement on a bronze plaque at the very front entrance of the club, which was wow. very impressive. Uh, so oftentimes it's it's on the employee business cards, it's on member statements, but that mission statement is endorsed and supported, and and that really forms the framework from which the other decisions are all made. But the fourth thing we see in in really successful clubs who understand uh, organizational health is that they've set the standards. They've, they've set the standards, the norms and expectations for what they want their board to do and what they want their employees to do. And, and obviously the board is, is key in, in setting the mores and the culture of a club. But again, if they've not memorialized this in writing and set those standards down, then it, it sometimes it happens by osmosis and it's better to have it happen uh, with an actively engaged board. And the final thing that we see that happens in really successful clubs is that there's a very serious new board member orientation process. Uh, club general managers who are successful really understand that the key and critical component to their success. Uh, when there are new board members who come onto the board, they need to understand their role. They need to understand uh, who the uh, employees are. They need to understand uh, what the physical assets are. So we suggest a half-day process where the board members are really toured through facilities. They meet all the key managers and employees, and they're given a very thorough orientation. And quite frankly, that should filter on down to the committees as well. Now, if those things are done, if those five uh, standards are in place, you typically see clubs that, that are very healthy organizationally. And if that's the case, then everything else flows from that. So those would be the five things I would say that, that we see consistently in, in very successful clubs. Well, there you go. There are five things that you can implement in your club in 2017 and really put it on a trajectory for success. Thanks to Dick Coplin for that sage advice back in episode two. Moving on. We had probably my favorite piece of advice in the history of Private Club Radio last year. I actually took this advice and really ran with it. I wrote an article about this. It was titled, Membership is Not a Sprint. I spoke all over the country and even overseas at conferences and put this advice in all of my slides at those presentations because I thought it was that good. 
So in this clip, I'm talking to Susan Green. She was the president in 2016 of the Professional Club Marketing Association. So the answer that you're about to hear right now is in response to a question that I posed her. And that was clubs that have uh, become discount houses, how can they get out of that rut? So she's going to answer that question. And then I'm going to lead into another question about how to close a sale. And this is where I got some really unexpected advice from Susan. Here we go. Um, So I think those are the directions that I think that I would go in. If you're in a club that um, consistently... um, is is losing membership and you're having to run faster than that hamster wheel, then I think that that's a bigger issue that you've got to rally the entire team to say, okay, how can we change our perception in the community? Where where are we positioned? How can we how can we reposition ourselves so that we fit into the right peg? You know, maybe maybe we are trying to compete with clubs that are at a higher initiation, at our, at our higher level. Maybe if we reposition ourselves and reposition our club to be the club for a certain market segment, then we don't have to discount because we have our pricing fixed where we need to be. I love that point. I think any time of any business and especially a private club can really create or carve out a niche, I think that's, that's an incredible place to be because it attracts people. You can attract like-minded people that way. Now, a lot of salespeople are great at presenting the features and the and benefits of their club. But when it comes right down to the end, they actually have a little difficulty asking for the sale. I think that's something probably I'd say 9 out of 10 salespeople in any industry probably have a trouble asking for the sale and closing mm-hmm. the sale, closing the deal. Now, you're a great closer. Do you have any tips for closing that sale or, or asking for the sale? <laughs> You know, you're absolutely right. You know, it's like, would you would you go into a, that, we'll go back to that used car analogy. <laughs> and you go in there and of course the first question is, are you ready to buy today? Right. You know, um, I, I think that one of the things that, um, first of all, if, if you haven't in a long time taken a sales course, um, this is part of that education. You know, when you're when you're part of um, an organization, you continue to try to grow yourself through education. I think one of the most valuable tools that you can do is take some education courses on sales. Um, remind yourself that your goal is not always to get the check. Your goal is to move the sale forward. So if you're, this is the first time that you're talking to a family in your club, what's your goal? Is your goal to get them introduced to other families at the end of that conversation? Is your goal to try to get them to understand what your club is about? What's the goal of that call? And that's a close. You know, I mean, if you, if you achieve your goal, it, it, it may not always be getting the check. But I think when you, when you have to set out to say, okay, I, I'm setting myself a goal today with this call, with this client, and here's what I want to achieve. So pat yourself on the back for closing that particular part of what it is that you want to accomplish for that day. Loved that. Absolutely loved that. And as I was speaking with Susan, I didn't even really catch it until I heard the interview afterwards. And I think that is probably the best advice that I heard all year is that your goal is not to make the sale as a membership director or as a club or as a membership committee. It's to move that sale forward, whatever that is for you. A lot of times people try to make the sale immediately. And that's actually where I was going with the question. How do you get more people to say yes? But Susan took that in a whole other direction, showing me and you that the goal is not always to get them to sign on the dotted line, but it's to just get them further down along in your sales process. Awesome advice and hope you enjoyed that one. Go back to episode number seven if you didn't hear that episode because the whole thing was chocked full of great advice. I wish I could play the whole thing here. So this next clip that I'm going to play for you comes from Greg Patterson back on episode number 11. I was speaking to Greg about finding and hiring the right talent for your club. And this is the sage piece of advice that he gave me when I asked him, how do you find those rock stars out there? Well, the the, the difficulty is you're always, my my big thing, my litmus test is, first of all, are they happy people? That's that's one thing. <laughs> Secondly, it's the same three criteria I use. Uh, so you interview somebody, you can tell within two minutes 
if somebody's a happy person. And if you can't, you just you haven't observed the human condition. Uh, secondly, you know, do they have a love of the business? You can say, why are you in the hospitality business? Why are you in hotels or clubs or whatever? And you can tell in one minute if they're in it. Well, it's a job, and I didn't have to have any skill set in order to get into it. Uh, it you can tell right off the bat. Sure. And 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 lastly, is do they have do they have this big love not only for the business but for hospitality? I give you an example. When you're in, you're, you're going to interview an employee, right? Leave them in the lobby so they're observed by your front desk, and they sit there. Have them tell you and say, oh, the, the, the meeting's been delayed for 15 minutes. And what they're doing is observing. And you have people walk by them. Do they make eye contact with them? Do they say hello to those people? It, it's very simple, right? Yep. So all of a sudden you find out. Next, before you come into your office, because certainly my office is down an alleyway, so you, you can't see it from the lobby where you'd be seen. Put a napkin on the ground, a paper napkin on the ground, and then you bring them in. See if they pick it up. Nice. So you'll find out if they have hospitality right. in their soul. Yep. Uh, they're very simple tasks, but people don't do that. So the rock stars, I find that I, I mean, what I've always hired is attitude, not aptitude. Loved that answer from Greg there. He was a really, really wonderful interview subject to have. If you didn't listen to episode 11, go back there. And uh, that whole thing is chocked full of goodies for sure. And another interview that was chocked full of goodies was Michael Crandall's interview back on episode number 14. Here's Michael's answer to my question about perspective and where do you find perspective? Well, perspective means you're having a broad picture. You're going to pull away. A lot of times at clubs, you get so involved with it, uh, uh, members and, and management as well, that you're looking too close. You need to really pull back and uh, look at the big picture of things. Uh, because every manager has heard over the course of their careers, uh, quite often, by the way, uh, you'll be discussing an issue and one board member will suddenly say, well, well wait a minute, what are other clubs doing? Uh, what's this place down the street doing? Uh, what, what's, what are other clubs that are similar to ours? What are they doing? And unless you have perspective, you really can't answer that because what happens is without perspective is decisions are made based upon emotions and gut feelings rather than hard data and, and facts. Well, there's a, a firm, again, I'm not doing commercial, but the best one is called Club Benchmarking, and you can contact them. And they come up with, with marvelous tools that uh, answer questions like, well, what type of salary ranges are for the key positions at club? Depending upon your annual gross revenues, uh, what is the number of uh, staffing levels that you have at the club? Based upon number of the golf holes you have, how many acres you have, um, what is really the cost that are accepted as best practices uh, kind of between the goalposts, if you will, that it really takes to operate that type of stuff. Without the perspective that I'm describing here, um, you just have you just no benchmarking, if you will, and it's really like uh, just operating in a vacuum. Now, I don't want to take away from the fact, by the way, and I'm a big subscriber of this, is that board members will often ask, understandably so, and we as, as general managers around the country, they'd like to know what other clubs are doing as well. That doesn't take away from the fact that at the end of the day, what's really important is not comparing your club to other clubs but just being the very best that you can be and what your members want you to be. So in that clip, you heard Michael refer to Ray Cronin and Russ Condy of Club Benchmarking. And we had Club Benchmarking on episode number 19 of the show, and they brought some pretty impressive data and told us about some stats that they were seeing in the private club industry. I asked them specifically in this clip if it's better to be a smaller club with higher dues paying members or a larger club with lower dues paying members and here's the very intriguing answer that was given but to the question which is is great clubs it's about dues revenue that's the key what's the total dues revenue and and russ and i and the team at club benchmarking often refer to the dues engine and the goal of every club is to increase dues revenue because if that is the fundamental driver of gross profit margin, and that's the fundamental driver of what you can spend on your expenses. And But you, we talk about the dues engine, and we think of it as there's two things that drive dues revenue, how many people belong and how much it costs to belong. Right. What you can see from the data, and this again is counterintuitive, but if you were to poll a whole bunch of board members of private clubs randomly, and you would ask them, are nicer clubs 
much more expensive than last night's club? The answer probably instinctive would be 100% yes. But the data shows the opposite. Oh. That the nicer clubs are not necessarily more expensive, but they do have more members. So there's some of the nicest clubs in this country that when you look at the amount you pay annually to belong, it's the same as the most pedestrian clubs in the country. Now, they'll have a higher initiation fee, no question about it. It'll cost more to join, but once you're in, the cost of belonging isn't greatly different. But they get that critical mass of dues revenue by having a lot of members. And if you go back through that chain, it's perfectly logical. They have the dues revenue to make the investments, as Russ said earlier. They have more members because they make they have more to offer. And since they have more to offer, what's going to happen? They have a broader perspective member demand, and where's that? effect higher initiation fee and it's kind of like the virtuous cycle so clubs don't have to good nice clubs don't have to get there by being more expensive that being said there are some clubs that have less members and they are more expensive and that's a choice they choose to keep it let's say smaller and more exclusive but that's not the primary driver if that makes sense that makes absolute sense (laughs) and then i'll just i'm going to read you this data because i think the listeners will We'll find this uh, compelling and very interesting. So back to Russ in you know, breaking up the industry into those four buckets. So there's four quartiles. If you take the industry and you just break it out on those revenue lines that we said earlier, and this is just clubs with golf. The same phenomenon is true in clubs without golf. But if you look at the lower quartile of the industry, the median initiation fee is $4,250. And the median member count is about 300 full member equivalent. If you look at the sex, the next slide, the next up quartile, that initiation fee jumps to 12.5, and the full member equivalent count goes to 360. You go up to the third quartile, the initiation fee goes to 25 grand, and the full member equivalent count goes to almost 500. And then in the fourth quartile, the largest quartile, those large clubs, the initiation fee jumps to 60 grand, and the full member equivalent jumps to almost it was 750, essentially. Wow. But the dues, the, the amount of member pays across those quartiles, those other numbers are jumping exponentially, but the amount of it costs to belong to the club is only varying across those quartiles by 30% or so. Hmm. So much less variation in the amount of cost to, to belong every year. Fantastic stuff there. The next clip that I want to bring you is Norm Spitzig of Master Club Advisors. He appeared on the show in episode number 15. In this clip that I'm going to play for you, Norm answers my question about what boards and members are looking for out of a great general manager. Here's his answer. Uh, the sixty-four thousand dollar question. <laughs> it really is. Um, there's there's some things though that I think are given. Um, I think they want core characteristics in their in their manager, and that means integrity. You know, that's a given, obviously. But you know, if you don't have integrity, you're not you're not going to be there. It doesn't mean you know all the answers and you do everything right. It doesn't mean though that if you make a mistake, you make a mistake. Right. I think clubs want a person with a core characteristic of being a people pleasing person. Um, you know, if you're a misogynist or you really don't like people, you're probably not going to be a good club manager. You like somebody who really gets a kick, kind of like the Greg Patterson of the world who gets a really kick when something goes right at this club. I did, a search for, I did a search for a club in Florida one time, seven, eight years ago, and, and one of the candidates was, was really qualified on paper. I, I had known him a, a, a little bit, and he gave great answers, but they were short and terse. And finally, I can still see the president saying, you know, your answers were good and we like you, but, but being a club manager is about being friendly. It's about being outgoing. It's about making people happy. Can you make people happy? And he said, yes. <laughs> One word answer. There you go. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't get the job <laughs> because he, he didn't have the personality. Sure. I think the third thing they want that's sort of a, a core thing is they want somebody who's a, a true leader. 20 years ago, you know, early in my, my time as a club manager, a lot of gentlemen were not 
participant, equal participants with the board in terms of the major decision making. And the board obviously makes the big decisions in terms of governance and or strategic planning. But they want a general manager who will bring facts to the table today, not just some a yes man who'll, you know, respond and do something that really doesn't make sense. Um so those are those are sort of the core things. Obviously they want a manager who has uh, sufficient expertise in running the club. It doesn't mean you know everything, but that means it's somebody who has the competencies to succeed, you know, manage the people, manage the asset. Maybe the most important thing today um, for the right manager for the right club is having someone who is culturally compatible with the club. Greg and I talk about this a lot. You know, Greg's big on defining what a club culture is. And if you know anything about the beach club, um, the, the beach club is a happy, fun place. I am sure everybody who belongs there is not Pollyanna, and I'm sure they have the challenges like every club. But when you go there, it's a respite away from home. You know, I did the search for Greg's replacement, which was really very interesting. It was a year-long project to find the right person, you know, finding somebody who follows in Greg's footsteps right. is sure. not easy. But yeah. we, found a, we found a good guy. You're not going to find another Greg. We understood that. But the important part was understanding that this is a culture of happiness. The people belong to the Deeks Club. Many of them belong to Los Angeles Country Club and the Vintage Club and all these really, quote, higher-end clubs. Um but maybe they're not as much fun as the beach club. So they, they they want somebody who understands and is a good fit for that culture. You know, I look back at myself and for a dozen years, I ran Fort Wayne country club in Fort Wayne, Indiana. While I was there, we had a wait list and we had plenty of money in the bank. We had a full complement of members. Um, that was the time, but more importantly, I'm a Midwest nice guy, I think. Um, I'm all Midwest anyway. And my, my <laughs> wife is Midwest, and they're they're Midwest. And we sort of had the same sort of values about life. And if you can work at a club where there's that cultural compatibility, I think it 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 allows the manager to be successful uh, more often and more likely. I, I think it allows the board to better understand their manager. So those are certainly some of the characteristics. Well, that's going to wrap it up for part one of our best of series. Join us next week. I'm going to bring you part two to give you another taste of some of the great guests that we had here in 2016. And we will start our 2017 off right with Jeff Morgan, CEO of the CMAA in the week following that episode. So I hope you guys have had a happy new year. And I hope that this year, 2017, is a spectacular one at your club. I hope this year brings you a lot of personal joy and success. And I hope to see you back here next week on Private Club Radio. Until then, here's to your membership success. Private Club Radio is brought to you by the Private Club Agency, the premier marketing and consulting firm dedicated to helping clubs increase and retain their membership. Visit privateclubagency.com to learn more.